I believe that future generations will look back on this time as a very pivotal moment in our history. I think they will see a time where we have gone from conventional warfare with two armies standing against each other to a much more unconventional and nebulous type of warfare where we are fighting really radical terrorist groups, not on battlefields necessarily, but on our streets and our transportation hubs. The 21st century has seen a increase in what I term asymmetric multimodality terrorist attacks. This increase has been evident on streets of our major cities in Europe, on New York City, the Pentagon, and Pennsylvania on 9-11, and elsewhere in the world. Large major events like we saw in Paris and Brussels in 2015 are all too common. Smaller events, not nearly as large, are seen almost daily. I feel that this represents a healthcare crisis emerging now in the 21st century. So those of us in the healthcare field, what does that mean? How do we now need to act to cope with this, to respond to this, to prepare for this? Because of course it is us, the emergency healthcare workers in particular, who are on the front lines of this new healthcare crisis. And I would go even further to say that it is actually the pre-hospital providers, EMS personnel, who are truly where the rubber meets the road in this new dawn of asymmetric multimodality terrorist attacks. So because of that, I think we have to create something new, something different. We have to be, be proactive rather than being reactive. I feel we have to create something called counterterrorism medicine. Now what does that mean? Well, counterterrorism has been used for years um, and really refers to the steps that law enforcement, intelligence, and others take to both prevent and mitigate against and then respond to terrorist events, but more on that law enforcement and military level. We in the healthcare field, well, we're not military, we're not law enforcement, we don't carry guns. However, I think we do have a seat at that table because I think there are very unique aspects of what I am now terming counterterrorism medicine that we need to take to heart and that we need to act upon. And these steps are not just in response. These steps are in mitigation, preparedness, scene safety, and other aspects of response. So let's take a look at a couple of the events that have occurred since the turn of the century to emphasize what I'm trying to say. Well, of course, 9-11 was an was a, a, a altering event for all of us across the world. 9-11 um, really brought home to the United States and the Western world how vulnerable we are now to these new asymmetric multimodality attacks. First time really we saw that in a large scale event in a Western country, developed country. So what do I mean by asymmetric and multimodality? Well, asymmetric means instead of a linear event where there is a bomb that goes off or there is a shooting that happens or there is some other event that happens, there's a start time, there's an end time, and it's done. We have asymmetry. We have multiple events happening at multiple times. We have multimodalities. We maybe have explosions, blasts, gunfire, worse, chemical weapons, maybe something else. So because of this, we have to prepare and respond in a different way. As 9-11 showed us, we're vulnerable. As other attacks have showed us since then, Paris, Brussels, Istanbul, Mumbai, not only are we vulnerable as a society, but we as responders are vulnerable as a either primary or secondary target. All too often now in these last 20 years or so, we have seen responders targeted. We have seen EMS and others going into events only to then be shot at, try to be uh, victims of an explosion or worse. If you look at the Madrid train bombings that occurred uh, prior to uh, or after 9-11, we saw some evidence of this. 
while there were 10 explosions, there were 13 devices. So while responders were going through the rubble helping others, they came upon these devices. Now luckily, these three devices that did not go off initially never did go off. Perhaps they were duds, or perhaps they were geared actually to hit the responders. Let's look at the Boston Marathon. Now it may be <clears throat> that the two explosions delayed by a couple minutes and apart by about two blocks were meant to go off at the same time and it was a mistake and they didn't, or more sinister, perhaps the first blast was meant to go off and then as responders ran towards that area and others ran away, the second blast was delayed and geared to hit those responders and those running away from the first blast. So again, what we're seeing with these different events are very sinister minds, but very intelligent minds coming up with very creative ways to do harm to us. And I think Europe, United States, developed countries in Asia and others, I think are more and more at risk to this. So because of that, I think as a healthcare provider, and in particular, emergency healthcare providers, pre-hospital EMS providers, those of us who are on the front lines of these events, really need to think long and hard about what to do. And I do feel that there is enough meat on that bone to create something new, to create something we call counterterrorism medicine or counterterrorism EMS. Think about mitigation for a moment. How do we mitigate and then prepare for different events in this day and age where we don't have an endless supply of money? Well, the way we do that is we conduct a hazard vulnerability analysis, what we call an HVA. And this essentially looks at whether it's a hospital, a city, whatever it is that you're examining, looks at it from an objective perspective to try to estimate what you're most at risk for. It's a relative risk assessment. So it's not necessarily what's most likely to occur, that is part of the data collected, but it's also of those events that are likely to occur, it is what you, how you are prepared for each of these events. So for instance, if in your community earthquake is likely and flood is likely, if they're equally likely to occur, but you have prepared well for earthquake, however, have not really prepared well for flood, flood in the analysis, at the end of the analysis of the HVA, will come out on top and the earthquake under that. And if you can think about this for hundreds of different events, you get an understanding of what an HVA does. An HVA allows you to take the limited amount of funding that you have and de dedicate that funding to mitigation and preparedness for those events that you are most at risk for. Now let's take that and look at terrorism for a moment. Now a traditional HVA, the various tools that we use, do provide in some degree for what we call man-made events or intentional events. Um, I think, however, maybe we need to create a new kind of HVA as part of this counterterrorism medicine idea. Maybe a new HVA that examines specifically terrorist type events or intentional events because they're different. What's different from a natural event compared to a terrorist event? Well, they're intentional, of course. But if they're intentional, that means they are specifically designed to cause the most damage, loss of life, and morbidity. Translate that then to healthcare resources you can then surmise that the casualties from an intentional event, a terrorist event, are going to have much more drain on your limited healthcare resources than on a natural event. Why? Because a natural event will naturally occur and you'll have some casualties, severe, mild, others, but they're not geared to cause as much death and severity or severe casualties as possible, like an intentional event. Therefore, in the intentional event, you can expect to use up more of your healthcare resources because you can expect more critically injured patients. One concept, one idea of counterterrorism medicine. What about how we might target hardened things? How we might identify targets and then try our best to harden them? I always like to say that terrorists are like deer. Okay, for those of you who are deer hunters, you know that if you're trying to track a deer, the deer will not walk through, or is much less likely to walk through, that very rugged terrain, hard, lot of brush, difficult path. Rather, they will take the easy path, the already worn, not difficult path, or path of least resistance. 
Terrorists are the same way. Terrorists will take the paths of least resistance. What do we call those? Soft targets. Let's look at Brussels, the Brussels attacks, and what happened there in 2016. In Brussels, the terrorist cell was actually preparing to do a follow-up attack on Paris. While they were preparing to do so, they felt pressured by local police and others closing in on them. They knew they may be captured soon. So what did they do? They decided to abandon the idea of attacking again in Paris, and they wanted to make sure they could do an attack as quickly as possible and have an effect. So they took the path of least resistance. What was that? Transportation hubs right there in Brussels where they were preparing. Train station and airport. How easy was that? How easy was it to walk in with bombs to an area that's wide open, lots of people, and detonate? Path of least resistance, soft targets. Especially easy if you don't have an exit strategy or you don't need an exit strategy. Then you don't have to worry about getting out, just getting in. So if we, in an attempt to mitigate and prepare, look at the things around us, if we're a hospital, if we're an EMS system, a city, a small town, why don't we look at the things around us as part of this new kind of HVA and say, well, what are most likely targets, easy targets, soft targets, in my community that a terrorist might take a good hard look at? Is there an auditorium or a sports venue nearby? Is there a mall nearby? Are there other areas where people gather? Are there other areas that are, that are soft? Hospitals in and of themselves are very soft targets. How many open doors are there in hospitals? How many ways can you get in very easily to hospitals um, without having to really encounter security or anything like that? We look at these different things. We see possibilities. We look at how well prepared we are for them. We identify them. And then we take steps to mitigate and prepare for events there. We target hard in these areas. We look at that mass gathering area and say, okay, how can we target hard in that? How can we make sure that if something happens there, first of all, it'll have as little damage as possible, we'll be ready and prepared to respond to it, and we'll target hard in it. How do we target hard in our hospitals? Well, we create systems whereby on activation, all the doors except two or three lock. Other things happen within the hospital to make sure it gets harder to infiltrate and to attack. We have to start thinking this way because in this day and age, again, we are in an age of very sinister minds, yet very intelligent minds, working very hard against us. And historically, unfortunately, we have been really primarily reactive to these events. A man tried to explode an airplane by putting bombs in his shoes. We now take off our shoes when we go to the airport. Somebody tries to do uh, another explosion on an airplane by mixing two small bottles of liquids together to create an explosion. We now can't bring, bring liquids onto airplanes. Something happens and we react. And of course we have to react by nature of the event. But I, I feel also that we need to be proactive. We need to look at these things in a proactive way. Now clearly a lot of this falls under the category of just simple counterterrorism. You know, the best way to deal with a terrorist attack is to prevent it from happening to begin with. So really it's the law enforcement, the intelligence, the others that are hunting these groups down and preventing these attacks from happening that are really doing the most good. But again, I do believe that we have a seat at that table as healthcare providers, particularly emergency providers and EMS, in ways that we can mitigate and prepare for these different events. Unfortunately, now in 2016, we know very well that a terrorist group called ISIS has used chemical weapons numerous times in their area of activity right now in the Middle East. Particularly, they've used mustard and chlorine. Well, I would say that it's not too easy jump from there to say that the next time an ISIS attack happens in a major metropolitan area or transportation hub, there is a distinct possibility chemical weapons may be used as well. Why not? They use them here, why can't they use them there? We need to understand this. We need to be proactive. We need to prepare for this. We need to be prepared for this asymmetric and specific multimodality attack using a C. Bernie type of attack, chemicals. 
That's part of what I call now counterterrorism medicine. What about the response itself? Seeing safety. You know, no longer do we respond to an explosion or a fire or something and wait and the fire chief says, okay, it's safe now, and then go in and feel comfortable that it truly is safe. Now we have to worry about, well, is the event actually over? Am I now, by going into the scene, a target as a responder? These are things that we have to build into our response plans and systems as part of this counterterrorism, medicine counterterrorism EMS. Look at Mumbai, the attacks in Mumbai. The attacks in Mumbai occurred over days, four days. There were 10 attackers that came in by speedboat that paralyzed that city for, ten, for four days. It's remarkable. But essentially, that scene was not safe for four days. Now, could something like that ever happen in the United States? Absolutely not. Why did it happen in Mumbai? Multiple different reasons. I think part of it is that the police were outgunned. There were not really adequate response systems like SWAT teams and military. And this horrible event occurred over the course of four days. The city was terrorized for four days. That could never happen in the United States because we have SWAT teams. We have other response entities that could come and put an end to that quickly. But the terrorists would never try that in the United States. In Mumbai, that was the path of least resistance. In America, in Europe, that may not be. It may be a different path. That's the path of least resistance. That's why if we are to do this the right way, we all need to look at our specific communities to who we are, what we do, and where we are, and try to identify those paths of least resistance, those soft targets, in our areas, in our communities, and mitigate, prepare, and respond to them. If we do this, I think we will take our first step towards being proactive to these events rather than only reactive. Again, we'll be taking steps towards what I call counterterrorism medicine. Thank you.